are doing chapter two, okay? So AP American Government, chapter two, we're gonna be looking at the Constitution of the United States. Um, this is a little bit bigger chapter than that introduction chapter, so let's get started right away. Now, the nice thing about this chapter is that it also, it also is going to cover a number of those foundational documents that we're required to learn about too. So let's start off with the first one, the Declaration of Independence. This is us basically clearly listing the reason why we're gonna break away from England, where we're basically declaring ourselves to be independent of it. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was the main author of this, and then a whole bunch of people signed it, kind of like people do group work. Um, and it was officially passed in, 19, uh, in July 4th, 1776, um, sort of. But we celebrate, of course, the day, our Day of Independence on the 4th of July each year. Uh, even though the revolution continued on long after that uh, and had started before that, we declare ourselves independent of the King of England. Now, if you actually look at the Declaration of Independence, you should look at it and think of it as a breakup letter. That's really what it is. We have a, um, it's a, us telling England that we're breaking up with them, but more importantly, we tell them why. In fact, we list a whole bunch of reasons as to why we're breaking up with them. And then after we win the war and we get our independence, we have to create our own government. Uh, and we try first with the Articles of Confederation, another one of our foundational documents, something definitely worth looking into. Um, this was our first attempt at a government and it ultimately failed. Uh, Articles of Confederation, basically what it did is it created this really loose association of the states. They were not the United States. Um, each state was considered to be their own independent uh, agency. And when people basically thought of themselves, they didn't think of themselves as being Americans, they thought of themselves as being a New Yorker. You know, they were more connected with their state. Uh, what they did when they created the Articles of Confederation is they wanted to make sure that they didn't fall into a government that was much like the government that just fought a war against. They wanted to create a very weak central government and to give the states their rights. So what we're looking at at the federal level, there's no president, there's no executive branch, there's no Supreme Court, um, there's no judicial branch. It basically consists of a unicameral or a one body Congress. Uh, each state got one person to represent their state in that legislature. So. Honestly, the, the federal government consisted of 13 people for the most part. Um, that we had a president who presided over Congress, but there was no president in the United States. There was no Supreme Court of Justice. Uh, and the laws were very difficult to pass. He had to have a supermajority of nine out of 13 votes. So there were some definite weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. And the longer we stayed with it, uh, the more obvious, is, obvious these weak, weaknesses were. Uh, the biggest weakness is they couldn't raise revenue. The federal government could not tax the people. If they needed money, they had to ask the states for it, and the states were under no legal obligation to provide it for them. Uh, this caused us to have to disband our army when we probably shouldn't have because we were at risk of possibly being reattacked by the by the British. Uh, it was really difficult to pass any law with a 19 to 13 vote, and it was almost impossible to change the Articles of Confederation because to make an amendment to it, you had to get 13 out of 13. When's the last time you saw 13 politicians agree about anything, right? No national court, no executive branch. Congress couldn't regulate trade. They couldn't regulate foreign trade or interstate trade. Uh, they couldn't create their own monetary system even. So each state had its own form of currency. And that made it really difficult for other countries to trade with us as well as trading within our own country too. So eventually it's obvious that the Articles of Confederation has its weaknesses and its flaws and we need to fix them. And so they basically in 1787 create a convention. It's going to be in Philadelphia and they're supposed to go there and, you know, fix it. But instead, many of the people show up there with the idea of not fixing it, but of throwing it out and creating an, a new government based on what eventually becomes the United States Constitution. Uh, these guys are going to work pretty much under secret in Philadelphia. Uh, they're not going to lot a lot of outside influences in there. Um, they close the doors, they close the windows. Uh, so that people can't hear them dis what they're discussing. And it takes them about 115 days, but they hammer out what becomes known as the United States Constitution. Now, this is just kind of a, an interesting aspect to it. There was a number of different factions among the founders uh, at that Constitution Convention in Philadelphia. In Washington, George Washington and Ben Franklin, who wanted a limited national authority. They wanted separation of powers. You had uh, John Rutledge and, and and Morris, who basically said you can't trust the common man to govern themselves, they're just not educated enough. 
You had Hamilton, who still loved the British monarchy system. Um, Madison and Wilson, who wanted a central government, was on popular support. And then you had a, a number of delegates who were like, hey, we're not supposed to be doing a new government. We're supposed to be fixing the Articles of Confederation. And when they found out that that wasn't the motive, that wasn't what was on the agenda, um, they actually left. But then most of them came back because they realized they wanted to be in the room when the decisions were being made. So 55 delegates were at that constitutional convention in Philadelphia. Most of them were lawyers. Some of them were business owners and plantation owners. Three of them were physicians, but that didn't mean they went to college because only half of them were college graduates. And by today's standards, they were quite young. Madison, 36. Hamilton, only 32. Dighton of New York was only 26. Ben Franklin was the oldest guy there, 81 years of age. So uh, that's pretty impressive. All right, so when they're creating this constitution, there's a couple of hiccups, a couple of sticking points that they have to basically hammer out. And one of them is going to become known as the, the Connecticut, Connecticut Compromise or the Great Compromise. Uh, this was basically creating um, what to do with Congress. Should Congress basically be based on population or should it be equally based uh, where every state gets the same number? Uh, small states obviously wanted representation to be equal. Small states by population I'm talking about. And big states by population wanted representation to be based on population. We have more people. We should have more say in government. So the Great Compromise was hammered out. We created a bicameral legislative branch. Bicameral, like a bicycle, has two wheels. Bicameral means that it has two bodies of it. We have the House of Representatives and then we have the Senate. The House of Representatives is there to make the states with a lot of population uh, happy. Uh, it's how many members you have in the house is based on how big your population is. The more people that live in your state, the more members you have in your house. So California, uh, with a lot of people in it, they have 53 members in the house. Um, Wyoming or Montana, where a few people live, uh, they have one. Okay. Now the Senate was to make those little states happy and it's equal representation. Every state has two senators, no matter how big or small that state may be. So this is what we're looking at for in the house right now. So for example, Wisconsin right here, that's where I would live. Uh, that's eight members in the house, right? And that basically can change and alter because we count every single person allegedly in the United States every 10 years with what's called the census. And we use that census to basically dictate how many members in the house each state should get. The thing is we have a set number that we use right now in the house and it's set at 435 people. So that means when we see people moving out of the uh, uh, an area of the United States and moving to other states, the only way your state can gain a member in the House is if some other state loses a member of the House. So if you look at this, this is basically showing you uh, from 2010, the states in this puke orange here are states that lost a member in the House. Now, this doesn't mean like their population is shrinking. It just means their population isn't growing as much as other states. So we can see that people are moving out of this part of the Northeastern part of the United States, and they're moving down into these like Sun Belts kind of areas, uh, or where they're moving to where it's warmer for the most part. Um, and this is also what we use for our electoral college system, which we can get into later on. But we basically take the members of the House and the members in the Senate. So Wisconsin has eight members in the House, two senators. So that gives us 10 electoral votes. So this was an interesting map that I came across. Um, people just don't recognize the fact. But right in these little blue counties, purple counties, I don't know, purple counties, um, that is half of the U.S. population. There's vast expanses of the United States population that have very few people living in it. All right, so back to the Constitutional Convention. Uh, we basically hammered out the, the Connecticut Compromise, the Great Compromise of splitting the, the, the legislative branch into two bodies. And then we also have to create up what's called the separation of powers. This is James Madison's uh, baby. He proposes this separation of powers where each branch, we're gonna have three branches of government, each branch of government has specific powers that they have. And then they also have checks or restrictions on the powers of the other two branches. So this is just going right back into like fifth grade social studies here. You got the legislative branch, that's the Congress. They create the laws. You got the executive branch, that's the president of the United States and the vice president. They enforce the laws. And then you have the judicial branch, that's the, the judges, including the Supreme Court, and their job is to interpret the laws. Well, that's a pretty basic understanding of it. 
that checks and balances, like I said, is where each branch has a specific power and uh, each branch has specific check or restrictions to the powers of the other branches. This is a little activity I like to do in class where I'll give them a bunch of different powers that each branch has and they have to put it into the right column of which branch is, is it checking. So, um, so here's the, the, the things they get. So if the Supreme Court could declare a law unconstitutional, for example, well, the Congress passes the law, the president probably signs the law, and then all of a sudden goes, the Supreme Court can rule that law unconstitutional. That's a, definitely a check that this Supreme Court has over the legislative branch, and depending on the situation, probably the executive branch if the president signed it. All right, so they created the Constitution, but that doesn't automatically mean that it takes effect. They have to push to get it ratified, they push to make it the official government of the United States. And that's not always an easy sell. It means throwing away a system that we've been using for over a decade at that point and basically starting with something brand new um, that some people were hesitant about because it gave so much more power to the federal government. So in order to get the Constitution ratified, we needed to have it approved by nine out of the 13 states. Okay, And this creates two different factions in the United States. We have the Federalists who wanted the Constitution passed. And we had the anti-federalists who were against the constitution and said it was too powerful. Uh, the federalists are gonna have the advantage. Most of the members uh, of that Philadelphia delegates had become federalists. They knew the ins and the outs of, this, of the constitution and they knew why we passed or created the constitution and had the wording that we had. They were there for all the arguments and all the discussions for all the rationale and stuff. Uh, they also have a much better name. It's much better to be positive than negative. Uh, and they were also usually wealthy individuals who tended to live in big urban areas, um, dominant parts of their state. These were people who were picked for a reason to go to that Philadelphia convention. They were leaders. And so that makes it a lot easier for them. What they do is they create a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of uh, essays basically in support of the constitution become, become known as the Federalist Papers. And if you've ever seen Hamilton, you know about that pretty well. Uh, what I would recommend that somebody do is that you should explore the Constitution. This is another one of those foundational documents. I have my students go through this and we explore the Constitution. They have to go through it and answer all these questions. It's a pretty uh, impressive document, to be honest with you. It basically lists, uh, it, it basically divides itself into seven different articles that looks at specific different things. The first article, Article 1, looks at the Congress. It looks at the legislative branch. If you want to learn more about the legislative branch and what they can and cannot do, you look at Article 1. And out of the Constitution, first of all, it's not that big of a document. It's actually pretty short. Here at my school, our students have to sign a co-curricular code of conduct that makes sure that they're not going to drink, use drugs and stuff like that when they're in sports or extracurriculars. Our co-curricular code of conduct is actually longer than the U.S. Constitution. Uh, so Article 1 basically looks at the legislative branch. Article 2 looks at the executive branch. It's like a page and a half. That's it. Article 3, which is all about the judicial branch, it, it's like two paragraphs. It, it's like a, a third of a page. There's hardly anything to it. So I definitely recommend exploring the Constitution if you, if you have it. Now, one of the things that those Federalists did to kind of soften the blow and to take away the argument of the anti-federalists who said that the, the anti-federalists were like, the Constitution gives too much power to the federal government, so they're going to abuse the people, just like King George did. They tacked into the Constitution right away the first 10 amendments or official changes to the Constitution, which we now call the Bill of Rights. Okay, those are the, those first 10 amendments that everybody should know. I always like to challenge my students and see if they can name the five members of Bob's Burgers or the five Kardashian daughters or the five Spice Girls, depending on what generation you're from, five Simpson family members, five um, family members from Family Guys. And most of the time, if they're working as a group, the students do pretty well naming these five different individuals in these different families. And then I ask them to name the five rights guaranteed in the First Amendment. And that doesn't go as well. Very few people can actually name all five of the rights guaranteed under the First Amendment. It's only, it's less than 1% of the population. So let's go through them and we're not gonna spend a lot of time on these, but everybody should know their constitutional rights because if you don't know your rights, how will you know if somebody's violating them? How will you know if somebody's trying to take those rights away? So right number one, First Amendment, freedom of speech. That's one of the five that you're granted in the First Amendment. 
And I should pre uh, give you a little preamble of this. First of all, there's two things that I think most people don't understand about the Bill of Rights. Number one, the Bill of Rights only protects you from the government. It's designed to protect you from the government. It doesn't protect you from private companies. It doesn't protect you from your boss firing. It doesn't protect you from your friends thinking you're a giant a-hole. It only protects you from the federal government. So, and the second thing you should know about every single right that you have, they are never absolutes. There are always restrictions and limits to your rights. So you have the freedom of speech. Can you say anything you want? No. And if you do say something, can you be fired from your job, lose your sitcom on NBC? Yes, absolutely, because it doesn't protect you from those. It only protects you from the federal government. There is always a line that you can cross also, okay? So if First Amendment, freedom of speech. While you have the freedom of speech, it also grants it to everyone you disagree with. Second uh, of the rights underneath the First Amendment, you get the freedom of religion. And there's actually two components to this, and we'll talk about this more in a different chapter. But it states that Congress shall make no law establishing a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So that's actually got the establishment clause and also the free exercise clause. It's kind of two parts to it. Once again, there's limitations to that. Uh, the next one, freedom to peacefully assemble. Here's a picture of a state capitol with a, a big protest crowd around it. You have the right to peacefully assemble. Can there be restrictions on it? Yeah, absolutely. You have the freedom to petition the government. Uh, our government under President Obama started an online petition place where you can go in and if they get enough signatures in a certain period of time, then the federal government uh, will address, they won't necessarily agree with it, but they will at least address what was petitioned. And this was kind of a mistake because it's the internet. Uh, so if you go on there, you can click on this link here, you can actually um, look at the petitions of the government. One of the first petitions that after they created this was like, to deport Justin Bieber to Canada. You know what I mean? So you gotta be careful what you let the internet basically dictate. And last but not least in the First Amendment, we have the freedom of the press, okay? The Second Amendment, the right to bear guns. No, wait, that's not it. It's quite, quite, that's not quite it. The right to bear arms. The entire thing says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Are there lim limitations to this? Absolutely. Just like there are limitations to every single one of these. The third is a kind of an interesting one because it doesn't seem even realistic. The right not to be forced to quarter or to house soldiers within your own home. The fact that we don't even see this as being a possibility shows just how well it's worked, I guess. But this was an issue that we had under King George. And so we wanted to make sure that that didn't happen in this new government. The Fourth Amendment, First Amendment and Fourth Amendment are two really big ones because the Fourth Amendment is something that happens a lot with police officers. Uh, police officers are usually pretty good experts about what is uh, what the Fourth Amendment allows them to do and not do. Uh, and there's also some great wording here, too. The Fourth Amendment protects you from unreasonable search and seizure. The word unreasonable is a perfect word to throw in there because what does that mean? What's unreasonable to me may not be unreasonable to you. Uh, and it can get really into specifics then. Uh, good examples of this is, you know, questions about whether or not it's constitutional is my school, we do a random drug search of our students. A certain number of students gets called into the office, usually on a Monday, and they basically have them take a urine test that gets sent to a lab to test for drugs. Is that a violation of my students' Fourth Amendment right? No, not according to the Supreme Court. Uh, can the police search you? Can they search your locker? Can they search your backpack? Can they search your car if they pull you over? Like all of these different, can they search your house? Can you are in a dorm room with a, a roommate? Can the roommate give the police permission to search your side of the dorm room? All these different things come up and it's really quite confusing to be honest in a lot of these situations of what police can and cannot search, but it's there to protect you, right? It protects you from unreasonable search and seizure. And a judge oftentimes is the one who decides what is considered to be unreasonable. The Fifth Amendment protects people who are accused of crimes because when we were a colony under King George, he oftentimes used the court system to basically deal with people he didn't want around. Um, the Fifth Amendment protects people who have been accused of crimes. First, you have to be indicted or charged by a grand jury. So before you, you, know, you get arrested, you don't just go to trial right away. The, they actually have to, like, well, they actually have to provide enough information to say that this what we have against you warrants an actual trial. They have to show a grand jury, say, hey, this is what we have. This is what we have against this person. Is a trial warranted? So it's a step 
there to protect you. If they don't have enough and the grand jury doesn't indict you, then there's no trial. Fifth Amendment also gives you protection from self-incrimination. That means that you have the right to remain silent. Yet very few people seem to take this right. Uh, when you hear somebody saying, I plead the fifth when they're on the, you know, the witness stand, they're, they t they're talking about this. They're pleading the Fifth Amendment. It also means that when a police officer basically reads you those rights, those Miranda rights, after you've been arrested and before you're questioned, they'll say that you have the right to remain silent. It's a really good idea that you take them up on that. You should be quiet. Nothing you say is going to help you, and anything you say may be used against you, but not for you. Talk to any lawyer. They'll tell you the same thing. Don't talk to the police. The Fifth Amendment also protects you from double jeopardy. That basically means that once they try you for a crime, if you are found not guilty, they can't try you again for that crime. So if I commit a crime, let's say I allegedly murder somebody, I go to court, I go to trial, and the jury finds me not guilty, let's say four days later, they find a bunch of evidence against me that kind of proves that I did it. They can't come back and retry me, okay? I can't be tried for the same crime twice. What that does is it protects us from the government abusing its power and just trying us over and over and over again until eventually they find 12 people who are willing to convict us. Um, they, we are granted the right of due process of the law. Our possessions and property should not be taken away from us unless they've gone through the entire process of the law. And here's the one that doesn't quite fit, right? Uh, it's called eminent domain. Um, most people don't, they're not real thrilled about eminent domain. It just seems fundamentally flawed or un-American, un really. Um, eminent domain basically says that if the government's going to take your private property, they can't just take it. They have to actually pay you for it. Uh, the best examples of this is when they they build a, a, they build a road, okay? Like maybe a bypass around a city, and it just so happens that it's going through your house. The government can basically force you to sell the, your house to them, knock it down, and then build a six-lane highway through it, okay? And it seems fundamentally unfair in a lot of ways in those situations, but what it does is it requires them to pay you for it. They can't just take it from you. The Sixth Amendment is also there to protect people who have been accused of crimes. Are you noticing a trend, right? A lot of these amendments are designed to protect people who have been are in the judicial system. Uh, the Sixth Amendment states that you have the right to a speedy public trial and the right to be tried by a, um, a jury of your peers, usually 12 people, but it's not doesn't have to be. So your trial has to be qu relatively quick. You can't get arrested and they are like, okay, we're going to have your trial in like nine years. You also have the right to a public trial. The trial needs to be open to the public. The only time we really close a trial is if it involves a minor who's being charged as a minor or there's an incident with a minor kind of thing. That means that you have the right to go to a courtroom anytime you want open up the door, walk into the back, and sit down in the peanut gallery there and watch if you want. And believe it or not, there are people who do this. You know, some people, when they retire, they take up woodworking. Some of them like to hang around the courthouse and watch trials go on. It's kind of fascinating in some ways. And then, of course, a trial by a jury. Uh, the Sixth Amendment also says that you have the right to be informed of the charges against you. They have to tell you exactly what you're being charged with. And you also have the right to question people who are going to testify against you. You probably won't be doing it. Your lawyer should be doing it because with the Sixth Amendment, you also have the right to a lawyer. And of course, if you can't afford one, one will be provided for you, kind of, not really. It depends on where you live. In the state of Wisconsin, we have a formula we use to see basically if you're poor enough to qualify for a public defender. And very few people are because we haven't changed the numbers in our system since like the 1980s. Uh, and obviously, you know, inflation has happened and stuff like that. And by the way, your public defender isn't free. They just have a different way of charging you. Uh, they have a set specific price that they charge you for a DUI or an aggravated assault. Uh, unlike a, a regular a lawyer who would charge you by the hour, these uh, public defenders just have a specific set price to go by. All right, the Seventh Amendment. There's Judge Judy. She's not a real judge, by the way, anymore. So that TV show's all fake. But she also makes like $60 million a year doing it, so who can blame her? The Seventh Amendment is basically says that if you are in a civil case, now there's two types of court cases. You have a criminal case where somebody's saying you broke the law. A civil case is when somebody is suing somebody else. So maybe your dog bites your neighbor, right? And then they sue you. That would be a civil case. Uh, if you are in a civil case and it's worth over $20, 
kind of really specific and weird, right? Uh, you can ask for a jury in that civil case. The Eighth Amendment is another one of these weird language things that really leaves things up a grab. It protects you from cruel and unusual punishment and from excessive bail or fines or punishment. So cruel and unusual punishment is the terms here. What's cruel and what's unusual? That, that depends on the person, the judge, the individual, the time periods we're talking about, the state we're talking about. All these things can factor into if something is cruel and unusual punishment. The biggest debate that people have in regards to something being cruel and unusual is the death penalty. So this map shows you the death penalty. The states in the red are the states that tech, technically have the death penalty. The states in blue do not have the death penalty. And the states in purple uh, are ones that have the death penalty, but they stopped using it because there was fundament, something fundamentally wrong with it. Now, even all those states in red, like California, for example, they technically have the death penalty, but they don't really seem to use it. They're not executing people. Uh, people will argue that execution of executing an individual for crime is cruel and unusual. And there's all kinds of good arguments about it. Um, it's definitely one of these things I like to discuss and debate. All right, the Ninth Amendment states that we have other rights than just those listed in the Constitution. They wanted to make sure that people didn't just look at this list that they had and say, well, these are it. That's all you get. No more kind of thing. And so they made sure that they recognize that we have other rights than just those listed. And the Tenth Amendment was to take the wind out of the sail of some of those federal, uh, some of those anti-federalists who were saying like, well, look at the federal government, still too powerful, even though they give these rights to individuals to protect them from the federal government, it's still too powerful. The Tenth Amendment basically says, look, if there's a power that's not specifically mentioned that we give it to the federal government and the Constitution and it's not prohibited from the states, then the states get to do it. The biggest examples of that are usually education, which is left up to the states to run, and how elections are conducted, which is basically on by a state by state basis also. All right, so actually you might've noticed a little change of clothing, but it's actually just the next day. So those first 10 amendments, that's the Bill of Rights. Those things were passed right when we passed the constitution. Now there are a total of 27 amendments that have 27 changes to the constitution. Think about how profound that is. That's very few changes. The first 10 were passed with the Constitution. So let's kind of take those out of the equation. That means there's 17 times in the 240 plus years as a country that we have altered our, our Constitution. Uh, and two of those, I don't know if we count because one was for prohibition and one was to get rid of prohibition. So like 15 times, that's it. That's the only time we've changed our Constitution. Making an amendment to the Constitution is very difficult, as it should be. But the fact that we've only altered it basically 15 times throughout our entire country's history is pretty impressive. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through those other 27 pretty quickly. Most of them aren't as significant or as important as those first 10, with a couple of exceptions. Um, and I put stars by the ones that I think are most important. Okay, So we'll hit through them real fast here. You don't need to know these at, at all, um, other than the ones I put stars by, which I think are more significant than others. Let's go through the 11th. It says that if you basically are suing a different state, that that case is heard in the state being sued. So if the state of Wisconsin would sue Michigan to try to win back the rights of the UP, I guess, um, it would be heard in the state of Michigan. The 12th Amendment fixed a screw up that our founding fathers created. Uh, it created a system where we now have a president and a vice president running together on the same ballot as a team. Before the original constitution stated that whoever won the majority of electoral votes became president and whoever came in second place became the vice president. Can you imagine that in this kind of political climate? You would have President Joe Biden and his vice president, Donald Trump. Yeah, I'm sure they would work well together, right? So the 13th Amendment, right after the Civil War, outlawed slavery. The 14th Amendment is a big one. It's one that we should know. It's one of the... That was one of the amendments that is constantly be argued in front of the Supreme Court. Whenever we see something, we think like, that's not fair. That's not equal. That's not right. It's usually the 14th Amendment that people are arguing. The 14th Amendment was passed shortly after the 13th, shortly after we had freed the slaves. And it was designed to make sure that these newly freed slaves were receiving the same equal rights and being treated the same way, especially in the court systems and especially with the law. The 14th Amendment guarantees us equal protection under the law. Now, it's a little bit more complex than that. It also says that anybody born in the U.S. soil is a U.S. citizen, and it's got a number of other issues. 
But that's the main component of it, equal protection under the law. So when you look at something like gay marriage, their argument was that it's a violation of the 14th Amendment not to allow uh, same-sex couples to get married. The 15th Amendment, that one gave African-American males the right to vote. And then, like I said, I just wanted to emphasize that 14th Amendment. It's important. It's significant. It's one of the ones that gets argued all the time in front of the Supreme Court, along with the first and the fourth. The 16th Amendment created an income tax. We didn't have one of those before. This was with those progressives in the 1900s and 1920s trying to create these new ideas and solve social problems. They needed the money for it. The 17th Amendment fixes another mistake of our founding fathers. Originally, our senators were basically picked by the politicians in each state. Uh, and that changed with the 17th Amendment, where we basically now have the direct election of senators by the people of the state. So the people in Wisconsin, we pick our two senators, not the politicians in Wisconsin. 18th Amendment, we tried a social experiment, prohibition. We outlawed alcohol. Specifically, the 18th Amendment outlawed the making, transportation, and sale of alcoholic beverages. It didn't actually outlaw consumption. The 19th Amendment granted women the right to vote. This is 1920. We become one of the last industrial Western Hemisphere nations to actually allow women the right to vote. Uh, the 20th Amendment is called the Lame Duck Amendment. What it does is it basically moved up the date from the uh, election to when the president, the next president takes office, gets sworn into office, their inauguration, so that it's not such a long period of time between an election and when that person needs to leave. The 21st Amendment repealed prohibition. We tried it. It didn't work. We got rid of it. The 22nd Amendment is thanks to FDR. Uh, FDR becomes the first person in U.S. history to win more than two terms as president. In fact, he won four terms as president. Uh, and then shortly afterwards, we passed the 22nd Amendment, which limits the president to serving two terms. So the longest a person can serve president is uh, two terms. Technically, it's just under 10 years, but that's a little bit more complicated we need to get into. The 23rd Amendment gave Washington, D.C. a vote in the presidential election. They have three electoral votes for the for Washington, D.C. Since Washington, D.C. isn't technically in any state, um, those people in, that in our capital weren't having a vote for who was president of the United States, which seemed a little harsh considering they're our country's capital. And so they got three electoral votes. The 24th Amendment was dealing with many of those southern states that were trying to keep African-Americans from voting. It prohibits a poll tax. You can't basically charge people to vote. You can't give them a literacy test. You can't give them an intelligence test. You can't do all of these little hoops that the southern states were trying to do to keep African-Americans from voting. The 25th Amendment came in kind of just the nick of time. The 25th Amendment basically gives the order of presidential uh, succession. It, it basically fixes the problem that our founding fathers had set up. Um, we all know that if something happens to the president, if the president dies, the vice president becomes president, right? That's pretty common knowledge. But then who becomes vice president? Right? Now, if you're thinking, oh, like the Speaker of the House, no, we don't bump everybody up one notch. That's not how it works. You know, what happened was in the old days, if the president died uh, and was replaced by the vice president, the new president just didn't have a vice president. But that leaves a hole there. That's a problem. What if something happens to the new president, right? So they created with the 25th Amendment, it gives the order of presidential succession. Um, it tells you exactly in a long line, there's like 18 people in a row who are basically next in line for presidential succession. It allows the president to be able to appoint a new person to be vice president. That appointment has to be approved by the Senate. Um, and also the original constitution only allows the vice president to take over if the president dies. What if something else happens to him? What if he uh, slips into a coma? Or what if she suffers from dementia and doesn't realize she's incapable of doing the job? All these issue, other issues could happen, right? So then we get into the situation where shortly afterwards, we have Richard Nixon as president. And in his, his second term, uh, shortly in the beginning of his second term, his vice president uh, that he had, a guy that by the name of Spiro T. Agnew, has to resign from the vice presidency because of bribes and stuff like that. So now Nixon and, and, and Spirit to Agnew, uh, we get rid of Agnew, he resigns, and Nixon, using the 25th Amendment, appoints a new vice president, Gerald Ford. Uh, and then a couple of years later, Richard Nixon gets himself into trouble with Watergate and ends up resigning from the presidency. 
So we got the order of presidential succession. The, the new president becomes Gerald Ford, who then appoints a guy by the name of Rockefeller to be his vice president. So then we got Gerald Ford as president, Rockefeller as vice president, and nobody had voted for either one of these guys. But thank God for the 25th Amendment, or we would be sitting there going like, we don't know who's president. So the order of presidential succession is president, vice president, and then it goes speaker of the house, then it goes to the president pro tempore of the Senate, uh, and then it goes to the order of the cabinet positions as they were created. So like secretary of state and so forth on down to the most re recent one created, which would be the secretary of, uh, of Homeland. So, all right, the 26th amendment, lowered the voting age from 21 years of age to 18 years of age. Vietnam war is going on. We are drafting young men, 18, 19, 20 years old to go to a war, but they don't even have the right to vote. So we lower the voting age from 21 to 18. And the most recent one, the 27th Amendment, and the only one passed in my lifetime was we basically, Congress gets to set their own salary, which that's a pretty nice gig, right? Um, and what we wanted to do was make sure that they weren't just giving themselves uh, unearned raises. So the 27th Amendment basically said, look, any raise that Congress votes for itself doesn't take effect until the next election meaning the American people should have the right to say whether or not that congressperson receives that, that vote, that uh, raise that they voted for. Sounds good on paper, but in reality, the incumbency rate, the, the likelihood that an incumbent is going to win re-election is over 90%. So, but at least it gives us a little bit of power, a little bit of say in it. All right. Now, how exactly do you amend the constitution? It's not easy. It's extremely complicated. It's extremely difficult and it needs to be. Uh, we don't want knee-jerk reactions. We don't want quick changes to the Constitution. These should be things that are well thought out, well discussed, well argued on both the national and the state level. So there's two components to this. One is proposing an amendment and then one is ratifying an amendment. Uh, proposing an amendment takes two-thirds vote by both houses of Congress, both the House and the Senate, and a two-thirds vote is pretty significant to get. Or you could do it with a special convention of state legislators, but we've never used that method. So let's just think of the two third vote by both both the House and the Senate. After it's proposed, then it has to be ratified. It has to actually be passed. Uh, in order to ratify an amendment, it takes a three quarter vote of state legislators to approve it. So three quarters of the states have to say yes. All right. Or you could have a special convention at each state to ratify the amendment. We've only did that once, and that was to get rid of prohibition. Okay. So three quarters, basically two thirds vote of both the House and the Senate to get it uh, proposed, three quarters of the states to say yes, to get it ratified. Lots of things have been proposed for constitutional amendments. There have been thousands upon thousands of them that have been proposed. Uh, only 33 have made it to the level of basically going to the states. And out of that, we've only have passed 27 of those. So a constitutional amendment, it's not easy and it shouldn't be. All right. I hope this works for you for uh, chapter two. All right. Have a good day.